Good morning. Uh, my name is Noam Surik, and I'm a senior technical marketing engineer at Gigamon. And um, the piece I'm going to talk about right now, after we've heard from uh, Wissam about uh, Splunk, is actually show how we generate metadata, and that metadata is being ingested by, uh, by, by Splunk. What kind of dashboards, what kind of use cases we have, and from there take it actually to the next step of some automation with AR. So <clears throat> starting with, with why metadata, right? When you think about it, Ananda mentioned earlier the fact that there are only uh, 6.7 nanoseconds between packets, which isn't a whole lot of time to actually extract meaningful information when you inspect the packet. On the other hand, when you think about the network and everything we've got in the network, we actually have a very rich data in the sense of metadata in our network. And if we leverage that metadata, we actually can get better efficacy on our security tools, we can get better time to resolve when we get a compromise. Um, you get uh, the ability to actually reach everywhere in your network, given the fact that metadata exists everywhere, right? We don't have to see the packet anymore. We just need to see the packet coming into Gigamon, extract the metadata off of it, and send it to a metadata tool, a, a metadata analytics tool. And uh, lastly, as I mentioned uh, in, in the very first uh, slide of mine, with metadata, I can actually amp the signal and reduce the noise. I can focus on what is important for us. OK, so just to make sure I understand right, when I have last seen you, you guys were just a visibility fabric filtering and distributing data to various tools. Are you now into packet analysis business as well? So we're not in the packet analysis business. We, we are still a layer in between your tools mm -hmm. and your live data. What we've done is the ability to alleviate router switches, uh, uh, network NetFlow generation appliances and do the NetFlow generation, whether it's v5, v9, or IP fix, on behalf of your network in a centralized manner. So you're now a network probe, uh, sorry, NetFlow probe. Um, I wouldn't call it necessarily a network probe. <laughs> proxy? Remember, we, we see all the traffic coming in. So we are a good proxy to the, what the network is actually doing. But someone has to analyze that traffic. Are the you tools doing are going to analyze it. So when you talk about that metadata there, it says DNS query response, URL access information, user flow records, all that. Who is generating all that? We are generating. So you, as a client, are generating that traffic. Your laptop no, no, I'm is generating the traffic. Who is generating the metadata? Gigamon is generating the metadata on behalf of your network. So you are a probe, then? We are a proxy, if you will. Yeah, you, can, you can think of it as a probe. That thing. So you are doing packet analysis. Not analysis. So the way to <laughs> generate... How do you generate metadata from DNS query if you're not looking into the packet? Okay, so analysis has got a very specific terminology. So that's why we don't call it as analysis. Okay. But you can, that's the reason why we don't say analysis. Mm -hmm. What Norm was saying was, as you mentioned, we've always been a visibility platform. Mm -hmm. Before, we were mainly generating packets to be ingested by the tools. Now, as you mentioned, we're extracting the information elements such as all the things that you see here, and generating that as metadata to the tools. Mm. Are we analyzing packets to, to extract the metadata? Absolutely, yes. OK, thank okay. you. But you don't call this analysis. <laughs> OK, my, <laughs> Just so my, we're sure. <laughs> my perspective on that is they're not drawing a conclusion from the analysis that they do. That's right. OK. Bingo. OK. Well yeah. said. They're simply converting from one format to another. They're, they're distilling it into exactly. the metadata which then other tools then have to perform. And analysis. we're giving you the control of what is created by, based on flows, based on sources, based on your knowledge. We're not going to tell you this is bad, this is good. This is the... the, the OK, the, so the, you are inspecting packets. <laughs> not <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to look into the packets because we need to extract data off of it. 
But as, as okay. your colleague said, we're not making a conclusion whether it's bad or Fair. good. It's, it's there. Yeah. In your metadata creation, are you creating it just so that Splunk can ingest it? Yeah. Or do you see that other tools would be able to ingest it? We same have metadata? other partners that are ingesting our metadata. Today, Splunk, Plixer, Scrutinizer are two of our uh, prime partners. Uh, we are in the works with other partners RSA, uh, uh, McAfee, Niara, HP, ArcSight, QRadar. So the format that we're generating is standards-based, V5, V9, IPFix. Obviously, in IPFix, you have a lot more flexibility, as I'm going to show in a couple of seconds, to, jet, to include other pieces of information, not just the rigid tuples that V5 or V9 uh, uh, include. So you have now your own hardware probes that would inspect the packets <laughs> yes. at, what, at what speed? Um, it depends on the platform. <laughs> we, yes. have, we have the HC2, and you could uh, ingest at a rate of about 12 million packets per second. Mm -hmm. We have the HC3, where you could uh, triple that okay. rate. So it all based on your need. What's the latency added? <coughs> I don't remember it off the top of my head. Typically it but remember, this is all out of band done. But it's typically, we're talking about nanoseconds added. And of course, there's the analytics piece of it that is tool dependent. How do we deal with encryption? We have encryption or decryption capabilities. We can do out of band decryption and we could do in band decryption. How about latency when you do decryption? I don't remember that either, I, off the top of my head. Anybody remembers? Yeah, it's typically in the order of a few milliseconds when, when decryption is done. Thank you. All right. So the whole idea was to actually gather traffic off the network, bring it into the Giga Secure uh, security delivery platform, and sorry, and actually extract that rich metadata that exists in our network right into the metadata engine. So the idea here is that, that your engines are simply replacing what the router would do. You're offloading the router from the, the task of doing Absolutely. IP fix. Absolutely. Okay. And part of the reason is and that... And there are no other formats you use. That's, that's your metadata format. Today we wrap it in NetFlow. Okay. But we do have roadmap uh, calling for syslog. So take <coughs> our metadata and wrap it in syslog uh, and some other formats, XML and, and JSON in the future. Okay. Okay, so Terry was polite. Let me rephrase that. Because the routers are really bad at doing NetFlow. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do it right. <laughs> I, I was about to comment on that, right? <laughs> routers are meant to route and switches yeah. are meant to switch. And when you have a span port or when you have something like metadata generation, IPFIX generation, and the router gets really busy, what's the first thing that it stopped doing? Metadata, right? Because it has to focus on routing. We don't. We have hardware dedicated to the generation of metadata, and it's doing it no matter what. And not only that, but we're doing it unsampled, one for one, mm -hmm. unadulterated metadata. All right. So you're asking, why should you care? Well, the reality is that the network is full that. of information. And if we're taking a seam as an example, if we just take that raw data and pump it into a seam, you're going to lose visibility. You're going to incur costs because you need big hardware to actually run the ability to an analyze all the, da uh, the, the data. And at the end of the day, you're looking at low performance. There we go, and we bring in one of our devices, in this case, the HC2, our primary platform today. And we take exactly the same data, but with the ability of filtering up front of only the data that we really, really care about creating metadata for, and actually sending that to the same seam, now we're seeing an increased efficacy in the tool because it gets the exact traffic it needs, you can reduce the costs for the tooling, and you get a much, much better visibility. Okay, now, to rephrase, what you're saying is, let me filter the traffic so you can spend less on your Splunk license. <laughs> Some of it. But also, let's make sure that Splunk... But let's make sure that the traffic that Splunk gets 
is actually the traffic that is needed yeah, I know. to do your analysis. <laughs> do you provide the ability to subscribe to particular data? I'm interested in bytes 3 to 7 and 3rd octet of every packet. Can I'm I sorry again? I'm interested in bytes 3 to 7 in every packet. Okay. That's all I need. Okay. Do you give me a bill to subscribe to this particular information? And yes. We have different functions within GigaSmart, for example, packet slicing, where you could say all I want is the headers and, sorry, is the headers and a little bit more into the payload, maybe 20 bytes, maybe 30 bytes, maybe 10 bytes. We can do that. But you could also filter based on other characteristics in layer two, three, and four, and including layer seven. So you can say, all I want is my web traffic. I don't care if it's encrypted or not encrypted. So look for anything port 80 and look for anything that has a client hello. Give me that. So it's easy to look up at TCP port. It's more complicated to look up into particular offset in every packet. And question is again, latency and cost in throughput. So when you do filtering in layer two, three, and four, it is all done at line speed, and I don't care what that line speed is. 1, 10, 40, 100 gigs, I can do it all. Because you have TCAM. Because I have the ability yeah. to look <laughs> into that, yes. How about conditional? If byte 7 has value of A, I would like to look into byte 20. Don't know. I'll have to uh, look into that. So you could use that up to packet filtering for that, right? Well, it depends on where, when you say byte 7, are you talking about byte 7 of the payload or byte 7 of the header? Let's qualify. It shouldn't really matter. It's conditional. But I no, do but it, it matters. Step. Because no, it's it the matter. headers. <laughs> it matters. It matters a lot. Particularly in IPv6, as you should know. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. So we, we have the capabilities to look into the payload using ASF, application session filtering. Uh, it's obviously not the topic for today, but we do have the ability to look into and then if you do want to do some conditional stuff, then you could do looping maps where you take traffic, put it into a one condition. If it matches, then do the next condition and just keep going. Understood. Obviously, with each loop, you're introducing latency, but it is doable. All right. So we've seen that earlier. Uh, in this particular section, we're going to talk about the detection, how we use metadata generated by Gigamon to look at what, what is going on and uh, actually feed that into Splunk. So this is where I want to introduce a, a new app, Ananda mentioned it, which is not yet released, so if you go to Splunk Base, which is the equivalent of uh, the iTunes Store or the App Store, uh, you're not going to see it. Um, we're going to introduce it in, in, a in a few weeks, I believe. Um, yeah, in two weeks. Uh, the Gigamon IPFIX metadata application for Splunk and th it's a set of dashboards that uh, give you the ability to ingest IPFIX right out of the box uh, for users who understand metadata but not necessarily understand what can be done with metadata for a security use case. Uh, it also does uh, uh, the ability to index the Gigamon IPFIX and search on it. Anything that, that uh, Splunk indexes can be searched upon. And let me introduce now the, the first of three use cases I'm going to demo in a couple minutes. The first one is using HTTP return codes as means to identify an infection in my network. And the reality is that if one of the laptops get infected with a bot, at some point in time, that bot is going to wake up and going to try and reach their C2, their, their command and control machine that is somewhere in the internet. Well, regularly, the internet is being inspected, right? And when we find problems, we try and fix them. So if that bot was dormant in my network for a month, potentially it's going to start asking for destinations that have been fixed and don't exist anymore. The protocol that these bots typically use is HTTP. So the return code coming back from that destination is 404, resource not found or destination not found, right? So as I start looking at my network and I know what normal-ish normal, normal -ish is, I should see a lot of 200s 
everything is okay. And I should see some background 404s because there are always some resources unavailable. But as that bot or bots start accessing these unavailable resources, I should see a spike in 404s. And just comparing that gives me a really good ability to look at what's going on and maybe there is an infection. So with that, let me jump right into my demo. So while Noam is bringing up the demo, I just want to point out one thing. There's a comparison that is drawn between NetFlow IP fix generated by a switch slash router, and you mentioned how they typically suck at that. Absolutely correct. I didn't say suck, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there's actually a much bigger um, aspect that we want to bring out here. Mm -hmm. Even if a router or switch is doing good NetFlow generation slash IP fix generation, <coughs> they're just generating information based on layer two to layer four, right? What you're seeing here is something much more advanced. Things such as HTTP response codes, examples that Noam was talking about, such as SSL certificate information and other things. So it's very rich contextual metadata. So the two things here, one is the metadata and the richness of the data. The second is the format in which it is exported in. We just happen to be using IPFIX today with some custom uh, information elements that we have used by using the power of IPFIX. But I think it's important to distinguish the two, the metadata and the format. Thank so, you. just to kind of show the dashboard that, that or the dashboards that we created with the uh, Gigaman IPFIX metadata app, uh, we've got different uh, dashboards. As I said, this is out of the box capabilities just to show what we can do with metadata. Um, okay. Excuse our, me. So, yes. this is a Splunk application. Yes. Which means that you're generating IPFIX records and Splunk is ingesting them and doing something with them and putting them in the database. And now you wrote an application on top of that that's querying Splunk database and showing the results in GUI format. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, that's what we're doing, mm -hmm. yes. All right, so we created some uh, specific dashboards that our SOC operation team actually uses, uh, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. So the first use case that we were talking about is <clears throat> the capability to correlate between the 200s and the 404s. So in the dial on the, on the left, uh, <laughs> it's basically a math. It's one minus the 404s divided by the 200s. It's just a relationship. And Steve is gonna launch a 404 attack in just one second. So notice that right now in the five minute uh, window that we're looking at, the bad count is very low, almost flat. But as soon as that launch, uh, the, the attack launches and starts recording, we're gonna see a spike in the bad. And as that spike, there we go, grows, our dial is gonna go back. And so the whole idea is that is it normal? Is it not normal? No, but it's a notable, as Splunk mentions, it's a notable that I can act upon and say, okay, who is doing this? Is it something widespread? Is it, is it somebody in the university where a university resource isn't available? Let's say the, the library website went down and everybody, all the students are trying to access it. They're gonna get a 404, it's not found. But I'm gonna see that the IPs are evenly spread. There isn't one or a few handful hosts that are actually generating that query, which means that as soon as that bubbles up, I can go and talk to my guy and say, hey, are you aware that your machine is accessing these unac unavailable resources? Oh no, I didn't know that. Or yes, actually I was trying to go to a site that wasn't there, all right? So that's the first use case. Any questions about this? Does it show the destination? It doesn't show the destination. What it shows is the source. I don't really care right now about the destination. I could create a dashboard that shows that, but I don't really care about the destination. I'm first and foremost worried about my network and if somebody actually is infected, I should go and contain that. And in fact, uh, if you couple that with AR, you could have said, okay, well, if there's a threshold, say, of 
150 404s in a minute. Contain that host. Put it to the side. Shut it down. Whatever. Yeah, so I'd be interested to know if the destination's on my network or if they're going Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So you could expand this dashboard to also show the, the destination ranking and do the correlation. So the beauty of this is that you can create your own dashboards. You have all the metadata in Splunk, right? right? So these were uh, dashboards that we created as part of our uh, SOC experience because those are the things we're focused on. But obviously, you may have a different need, and you can always create your own dashboard. Yeah. All right. So why didn't I see the the source IP of the system doing the attack there or doing the the 404s? I'm sorry again. Why didn't I see the the so, source IP address, or did I? And I just here's wasn't here's the source IP address enough. right there. It, it, you might not be um, it may not be clear. So let me just zoom a little bit more. I think the question is the source of what, and it's the was it only the going? source is the 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 host generating the request. It's not the response, right? So that's that's Steve's laptop. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Popping up, popping up, or bubbling up, right? Yeah, that's definitely my attack. Mm. I'm an I'm an infosec guy. I'm both. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's switch back to use case number two. Not and use case number two actually uh, leverages Shannon's entropy. Uh, math to once again find bad and the whole idea again going back to the bot right not only that those bot bots might be accessing uh, unavailable resources but in most cases these bots are going to use randomly generated domains right or machine generated uh, domains to access these remote sites if they're not using IPs well using Shannon I can say, you know, alert me if you're seeing a domain name that their score on it is above four, about four and a half, about 4.7, or whatever it is. And the idea is that Shannon use linguistics, right? After a consonant, we're expecting uh, a, a vowel. After a vowel, you know, in English, after a vowel, typically you're not going to have another vowel. Uh, you're not going to have five consonants in, in a row, uh, and, and they're not going to be the, the same five consonants as well. And so there are some uh, linguistic rules that can be leveraged to see, well, is google.com something normal or not versus some really long domains that make no sense. With, with Shannon Entropy, I can actually find out whether a normal responding web server is actually a good or a bad actor. And I'm going to switch back again to my so demo. Try, so try that with XKCD. I'm sorry again? <laughs> <laughs> so try that with XKCD. Oh, yeah. uh, com. <laughs> Why don't you launch it? Let's see if we can catch it. <laughs> All right. So for that, uh, I'm using our DNS uh, dashboard that we've created. And scrolling down, I here have uh, uh, an aggregation of unusually high uh, Shannon Entropy DNS entries ranked by their score. And you could see, here is truly a randomly generated domain but the top level domain, openstack.local, indicates that this is probably a good legitimate uh, destination or a good le legitimate query because it's, it's one of our openstack installations. Uh, and as you scroll down, you know, you could see some valid, in valid questions. As one learns their own network, they can start weeding these out of the query. So you, if you see anything that is uh, openstack.local, remove it. That allows the, the lesser numbers to start bubbling up until I actually have good data in my hand saying, you know, this is a bad domain. I should act on it. These are good domains. They're OK. Uh, and again, 
good and bad, you were asking, right? I am not doing the analysis per se. I'm letting tools that are good at this do their analysis. I'm just providing the right data in the right format at the right time. Good. Any questions on using Shannon's entropy? You know, using math to find bad? All right. And so let's uh, move to the last use case. And the last use case is all about, again, DNS, but in this case is finding DNS hijacking, all right, or a rogue DNS. Somebody comes in, puts a, a machine, makes it into a DNS server, and now I have the ability to actually provide pretty much whatever answers, whatever responses I want. So now that DNS can point to a false B of A or Wells Fargo or target.com and I could do at this point phishing and key logging. I can harvest you know, identity credentials from, from social security to credit card numbers and everything else in between. I can do a whole lot of bad stuff. And the whole idea here now is to know what is in my network, right? Because think about it for a second. From an operational standpoint, IT knows what is theirs. So IT can tell you, yep, we've got five DNS servers and these are five DNS servers, they're legitimate. Well, if I'm not harvesting DNS information and I'm seeing queries end to end from a client to an actually authoritative server, I have no idea that there are other servers in my network that are replying to DNS queries, correct? Which means that I have a really big blind spot here. With our ability to collect any DNS information from anywhere in the network, I can actually see a particular client making a, a query that isn't going to my authorized legitimate DNS servers, but it's going somewhere else. So, in that use case, it's really easy to say what is known and what is unknown in my network and actually flag it. And this is a really simple search. The search says if my DNS reply, re response server is 101020 or 22, those are domain name servers in my environment that I'm aware of, you can mark them as known. Same thing with 1060, that's a different subnet in India, that's still good. If it's any other than those, flag it as wrong. And in a couple seconds, Hamad will actually show you how we can act on ROG servers and actually shut them down automatically. So that's my demo. Um, if there are any questions, please. Yep. Well, one that's less of a technical question and more of a practical one. Sure. So if I start adding a bunch of IP fix records dumping from Gigamon into Splunk, does okay. that increase what I'm paying for Splunk? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's a consumption model, right? It's a consumption model, yes. Yeah. So you'd probably be better off to just have an enterprise license and just uh, consume all you can. <laughs> 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 hey, it's not funny. A lot of my customers well, do have that, and they're just consuming everything. Splunk is at the heart of their, their operation. Mm. So, thank you. Yes, more, please. More fundamental question. I mean, we all know history of NetFlow evolved into IPFIX, and we are in 2017. Yes. IPFIX wasn't meant to be streaming and coding. They are much better technologies. To Absolutely. Order of magnitude more efficient. Why are you stuck on IPFIX? Well, the answer is that when we started with NetFlow about two and a half years at, at version 3.4, I'm sorry, uh, 4.3. Uh, most consumers of NetFlow were using NetFlow as the transport mechanism. Yeah. It was only later when, when uh, you had Splunk, QRadar, and the others start consuming flow data. And you're right, there are better formats we are, as I said, mentioned earlier, we are working on having other formats, but the traditional NetFlow collectors expect NetFlow. And so 
a lot of our ecosystem partners are just net flow collectors and we're gonna still cater to them and add the newer formats like syslog and xml and json for the newer generation as well so that's coming up cool thank you i would also add that you know yes ip fix is not the most efficient right we all know that to put it <laughs> what's that <laughs> to put it yeah. light mildly right. yes um uh, however in the context of what we're trying to solve here for security operations where detection containment we're talking about weeks adding a few milliseconds or seconds of latency to detect a threat that's like you know a seventh degree rounding error right it's not about time it's about how do you compact data and you are streaming huge amount of data yeah yeah so every byte count Correct. absolutely and that's where the metadata generation and the format in we're drawing a separation today it's ipfix in future we'll <coughs> expect other formats